Have you ever wondered how heat from the sun travels across 93 million miles of cold, dark space to warm the earth? Or why your hand burns when you touch a hot pot handle, even though it is not in direct contact with the flame? These phenomena are explained by heat transfer, the process by which heat moves from hotter to cooler objects. There are three primary methods of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. In this video, we will explore these fundamental concepts through the derivation and implementation of computer simulations. The first type of heat transfer we will discuss is conduction. At the molecular level, heat is the average kinetic energy in an object. In solid lattices, atoms are bound together by interatomic forces. When heat is introduced, atoms vibrate around their equilibrium positions. When one atom is displaced in a lattice, it sets off vibrational waves known as phonons. Phonons act as thermal energy carriers and propagate through the lattice. Thus, hot objects will have more photons than cold ones. When these two objects touch directly, the higher concentration of phonons in the hot object will flow towards the cold object. This diffusion of phonons will warm up the cold object and cool down the hot object. Metals have an excellent thermal conductivity because their unique electronic structure allows for the unobstructed flow of these phonons. Note how a diamond has the largest thermal conductivity. This is because its pristine, uniform crystal lattice structure allows for the efficient propagation of phonons. But how does this molecular picture relate to the macroscopic heat transfer phenomenon? Let's imagine a solid slab of area A located between two large parallel plates of distance Y apart. The lower plate is kept at temperature T0 and the higher plate at temperature T1. At steady state, there is a constant rate of heat flow, Q, through the slab required to maintain the temperature difference, delta T. We find that the rate of heat flow per unit area, or heat flux, is proportional to the temperature decrease over the distance Y, as shown by the following. The proportionality constant, K, is the material-dependent thermal conductivity of the slab, where a high K means the material is a better conductor, like metal, as we discussed before. In its differential form, we derive the one-dimensional form of the Fourier's law of heat conduction, where dt is the temperature difference, dx is the thickness of the slab, and q is the heat flux. If temperature varies in all directions, we can express the three-dimensional form of Fourier's law as shown. All these equations model steady-state heat transfer, which is over very long time periods. But what happens when heat transfer is time-dependent, or when we want to model what is happening over a very short period? This is done using the heat equation. Let's imagine we have a small fluid box. When we perform an energy balance across it, we find that the rate at which the kinetic energy increases is equal to the rate that heat is added via conduction. This is equal to the following, where for the right side, we simply take the derivative of the Fourier's law. To simplify, we lump all constants, rho, the object density, Cp, the heat capacity, and K, the thermal conductivity, into alpha, which is defined as a thermal diffusivity. Let's simulate transient heat transfer across a solid square plate to model this concept. For the conductive heat transfer simulation, we maintain the boundaries of the plate at 100 degrees Celsius and start with an initial temperature of 200 degrees Celsius as shown. To determine the effect different materials have on the transfer, we simulate these conditions for PVC plastic, copper, and diamond. This is a 2D problem, which means that a numerical solution requires that the finite slab be split into square chunks of length delta x by delta y. After discretizing the square slab, we start with the 2D form of the heat equation previously derived. We can evaluate the right-hand term, which involves a first derivative using the forward finite difference equation. We can then evaluate the left-hand term, which involves a second derivative using the central finite difference equation. After simplification, we get the following expression, known as the forward time-centered space, or FTCS method, where n is the current time step, i is the x direction, j is the y direction, delta t is the length of the time step, and delta x squared is the area of the nodal mesh chunk. In simple terms, the equation states that for a discrete point on the slab, the future temperature is simply equal to the previous temperature, plus a weighted average of the neighboring temperatures. This way, as time goes on, the temperature of the material will become uniform and average out. The rate of this temperature averaging is given by the coefficient alpha delta t over delta x squared. 
Our boundary condition is that the outer points of the slab should be kept at 100 degrees Celsius. It is important to use a sufficiently small enough time step with respect to the mesh size to be able to converge the simulation. The algorithm's so-called truncation error can be evaluated using von Neumann stability analysis. The slab cools down near the edges first, as the center gradually reduces in temperature. This is nearly identical to putting a warm drink in a cooler full of ice. The outer edge of the can will cool down first, and the warm liquid in the center will follow. As expected, the diamond plate has the lowest internal temperature of 110 degrees Celsius by the end of the simulation. This is because it has the highest thermal conductivity, and thus the highest heat flux of all the materials tested. Heat is flowing outward, meaning that the diamond should have the lowest internal temperature after the allotted time. A similar trend follows for plastic, which has the lowest thermal conductivity. This means that there is more resistance to the heat flowing outward and retains a high internal temperature through the solid with only the very edge decreasing to 100 degrees as shown. It's this reason for which plastics are commonly used as thermal insulators. Copper, another common conductor, was somewhere in the middle as verified by its material properties. The second type of heat transfer we will discuss is convection. There are two types of convection. Natural convection is driven by the temperature dependence of density in liquids and gases. An example of natural convection is boiling water. Hot water is less dense and will rise, whereas cool water is less dense and will sink. This creates circular convection currents in the pot which efficiently heat all of the liquid. The second type of convection is forced convection. This occurs when heat transfer from a liquid or gas is enhanced by fluid flow. An important concept in forced convection is the thermal boundary layer. Later, we will assume that convection is occurring between the solid and liquid interface as shown. In forced convection, cool fluid flows past a hot solid surface. In the laminar flow regime, fluid flows in distinct layers with minimal mixing as shown. As the distance from the surface increases, the fluid temperature gradually decreases. Because the fluid flows slowly in the laminar regime, a large insulating thermal blanket forms around the boundary layer which impedes efficient heat transfer. At a certain distance delta T, the fluid temperature equals the free stream temperature, T infinity. In the turbulent flow regime, the fluid layers frequently and chaotically mix, causing the insulating thermal blanket not to form as easily. This enhanced mixing and high stream velocity allows for more efficient heat transfer. Note how delta T is smaller for the turbulent velocity U2 as opposed to the laminar velocity U1. From this analysis, we notice that the rate of convective heat transfer is proportional to the surface properties like length, heat transfer area, and fluid properties like heat capacity, thermal conductivity, viscosity. These relations are summarized by Newton's law of cooling, where Ts is the surface temperature, T infinity is the free stream or fluid temperature, and H is the heat transfer coefficient. Notice how this equation is similar to Fourier's law, where heat transfer is driven by a temperature gradient. Instead of thermal conductivity, K, we have a new proportionality constant, the heat transfer coefficient, H. Often, this coefficient is difficult to measure and is obtained from empirical methods. An example of one such equation is given below for force convection across an isothermal plate, where NU and PR are dimensionless numbers which represent fluid properties. We can actually use NU to determine the heat transfer coefficient, H. Let's simulate transient convective heat transfer across a solid square 1 by 1 meter plate. For this simulation, the surrounding fluid has a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius and the initial temperature of the plate is 200 degrees Celsius, as shown. We assume a heat transfer coefficient of 60 watts per meter squared Celsius and test the same three materials to assess the effect their properties have on transient heat transfer. Inside the plate, we will use the FTCS method to model conduction as before. On the edges of the plate, we are interacting with fluid. Thus, to derive a numerical solution, we start with the boundary conditions. We find that the convective and conductive heat flux at the outer edges should be equal. This is done by plugging in Fourier's law of heat conduction on the left and Newton's law of cooling on the right. When we plug in the finite difference equation for the first derivative, we get the following expression. The animation is nearly identical to that made with the conduction boundary conditions. The temperature profiles for copper, plastic, and diamond are shown after 100 seconds. A nearly identical conclusion can be made for the convective heat transfer simulation. After the time period, diamond has the lowest internal temperature and a more even temperature distribution as opposed to the copper and plastic due to its high thermal conductivity. 
plastic, just as before, faces more resistance for heat flowing outward as shown by its temperature profile. However, the final internal temperature is much higher than that of the conduction simulation. This is because the material edges are exposed to convective cooling, which slows the rate of heat dissipation due to the formation of the thermal boundary layer, which we discussed before. Oftentimes, we want to determine how temperature profiles converge to a steady state. For the last simulation, we model a thermal couple junction, recording the temperature of a gas stream, which is known to be 200 degrees Celsius. The geometry of the exposed thermal couple junctions can be approximated as a sphere. This sphere starts at room temperature, has a 4 mm diameter, and the gas stream has the fluid properties highlighted. The FTCS method is often computationally expensive and requires a detailed knowledge of the object's true geometry. A simple trick around this is to determine the analytical solutions to the heat equation via lumped parameter analysis. This method states that for Beal's number, the ratio of thermal resistance for conduction to convection less than 0.1, the spatial part of the heat equation can be neglected. This leads to the following heat balance simplification. The analytical solution to the first order differential equation is given by the following expression. We can also verify this by using the fourth order runge cuda or RK4 numerical solution, which states that a function evaluated at any point is simply the weighted average of four slope estimates summarized in the figure. This figure shows the thermal couple temperature over time, where the numerical points are highlighted by the circles, and the analytical points are highlighted by the straight line. The numerical solution fits the analytical solution exactly, pointing to the accuracy of the RK4 method. From the graph, we see that it takes around 160 seconds, which is about 2.7 minutes, for the thermocouple to read a steady state and thus record an accurate reading. In this video, we explored the theory behind conductive and convective heat transfer. We then derived, implemented, and discussed visual numerical solutions to 2D transient and steady state heat transfer with constant temperature and convective boundary conditions. In the future, it might be useful to run the simulation for longer times for better analysis of temperature profiles and how steady state heat flux is reached. In addition, experimenting with different slab geometries and more optimized CFD methods like finite element method might yield new insights. All of the animations and graphs were generated using MATLAB. The code and paper which explains all of the numerical methods used is in the description below. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to keep updated, as I have a lot of videos planned on fluid dynamics, optimization, and machine learning, which I plan to make shortly. As always, thank you for watching.